There's a lot in there for some of you parents that are wondering, are my kids getting anything out of church? These are, these are second generation, third generation Christian kids that have grown up and now they're going, okay, now I want to serve God with my life. Amen. Never quit bringing your kids to church. Amen. All right. Open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 4. I appreciate those gentlemen bringing that to us. Thank you, guys. And if you would see, uh, Brother Craig, would you raise your hand? You two, maybe see him at church. Make sure you get your name spelled right, all right? Uh, he's going to give you a bill. <laughs> when you come to our church, we charge you to come, all right? So just make sure you get, make sure you get the names right so we can you know, track down and all that stuff. Okay, Brother Craig? This is real contact tracing right there, all right? Uh, Nehemiah chapter number four, Nehemiah chapter four, are, are you still glad to be saved? Yes. And it's good to be saved, good to have a purpose in life. Uh, Nehemiah chapter four, and I'm going to ask that you stand with me for just a few moments. Nehemiah chapter four as we read the Bible together. Last couple weeks, and this is the last message in this series, I hope it's been a blessing to you as we're talking about opening our church back up. And what that means, we've talked about, uh, you know, the idea, the principle of sacrifice and why that, that is required. God did not open this back up for self-gratification, okay? And, and let me just say this as well. I recognize human instruments, but I want to be very clear with you. It is not a politician. It is God that allows us to do what we're doing, Amen. okay? And, and, and so we talked about the principle of sacrifice, we talked about the principle of service, we talked about the principle of separation and getting away from some things. God, when he brings those Jews back into their land to build the temple, there are some things that they've got and some people they've got to get away from in order to do what God has called them to do. Tonight I want to talk to you about a different kind of principle, and that's the principle of safety. Nehemiah chapter 4, look at verse number 7. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of get tired of days when I wake up and things are going well, then all, the word, all of a sudden the word but shows up, <laughs> right? Ah, right. oh, serving God, and then a uh, good message last night, a good message yesterday, and I'm really fired up, but my boss yelled at me, but the traffic in Denver is picking back up. <laughs> Praise the Lord, we're not locked down. I hate this traffic in Jesus, right? <laughs> right? You know, the, that, that thing just shows up in life, but it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up, and that the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were very wroth. When you attempt to do something for the Lord, it gets the devil's attention. You ever felt like, man, my life was easier before I got into church? Maybe it kind of was in some ways. In some ways. They ever felt like, man, ever since I committed to this ministry, I've got this family strife now that wasn't there. I've got this issue that wasn't. What is the deal? I'll tell you what it is. The devil hates you being involved in what matters to God. Verse number eight, and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, they shall not know, neither see till we come in the midst among them and slay them. And just notice this, them being slain is not even the objective. It's not even about us. It's about something bigger than us. Notice what, is it, what it says there, and cause the work, what, the work of God, cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by, the, uh, by them came, they said unto us ten times, from all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Isn't that good? Which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known in us and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. 
It came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the habergians, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, everyone, everyone with one of his hands wrought in the work, I like this, and with the other hand he held a weapon. Why'd they do that? Keep them, keep them safe. Keep the work of God safe. Father, tonight, Lord, we need your help. Thank you, Lord, for the men that have talked about their burdens and their fields that you've called them to. And God, even if our part is small in that, Lord, let us have a part tonight and let us be a blessing. And God, you've been so, so good to us and we want to thank you. Lord, thank you for allowing us to, to open this place back up. God, I, I don't. I know over time people and our, our nature, human nature, we tend to sort of become unthankful and just accustomed to it again. I don't want to do that. Lord, I, I don't want to forget, Lord, talking to a camera in my living room and praying that people out there were getting something out of it. Lord, I, I don't want to take this for granted. I'm thankful that we're here tonight. God, I, I miss these people and I miss what we've been able to do. Lord, I'm just so thankful. God, I pray that you bless what we're attempting to do, Lord, in continuing the work of God here at this church. God bless this message and bless these people. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated if you would. If you're not familiar, let me just remind you that sort of the time, it's like a landscape. Because the last several weeks we've talked primarily about Ezra and you might go, hey, why are we in Nehemiah tonight? Well, let me just remind you that technically Ezra and Nehemiah are contemporaries. Now, the reason you may not think that is because I, I said before that, that it was 90 years after the temple was built that Ezra shows up, and, and that's about the right time frame, all right? So, so Ezra, the book of Ezra, for seven chapters, Ezra's not in Ezra, all right? And, and so Ezra shows up, and him and Nehemiah, they, they work together in some ways, and, and so Ezra helps in to make sure that the, 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 the temple, the place where God's people would go and would meet with God. And, and as I said before, listen, I understand that we are no longer in the, New, the Old Testament. And you better thank God for that tonight. There was no eternal security. You have one example of that, and it's David, and he's the exception to the rule. The sure mercies of David. Outside of that, guys, let me just tell you right now, you don't have what you have today. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit permanently. You have the sealing of the Spirit of God. Your soul is cut away from your flesh. So no matter what you do right now, I'm not advocating that you sin, but no matter what you do, you cannot lose your salvation. What a blessing. Thank God for that. But, but I understand we're not over here anymore. And I understand in the New Testament, when we talk about the temple of the Lord, it's your body from a spiritual perspective. I, I understand all of that. But I'll also tell you this, the Old Testament shows us some things about the nature and character of our God. And God is particular about where his people go. God is particular about what they do when they're gathered together. They, we don't make up the rules on our own. We've got a rule book that God gave us. In the Old Testament, it would go to a place and you say, well, I can go anywhere I want to now. I can worship God in the forest. And all I can say is, I can tell you this much. Since this whole COVID thing happened, I've watched some Christians, man, flourish and, and really just come to life with just leaning on the Lord. And I've seen some that really struggle. You say, why? Those that struggle, you know what they missed? Right. Right. I said for years. Some of you guys have heard me say this for years. Take me out of church for a month. I'll be a different guy. And we've seen it. Some of you are like, yeah, preacher, you're really different. <laughs> I understand that the temple is not just this church. I, I get that. I understand that. I understand we're not here to worship the windows and the, the decorations on the walls and, you know, the, the doors that have been sanitized 47,000 times so you can come in here. And I, I get what, that is not what this is about. But now that we're here, there are certain things that God expects to be done a certain way. And God expects us to have a mindset of sacrifice and a mindset of service and a mindset of, of, of being separated from this world and separating ourselves from the things that will hinder us from doing what God wants us to do. Can I go a step further and say this? 
after that temple is built, you know what they realized? You know, we've got a problem, guys, because we've got this temple built, but our enemies are coming right in, and they're all around us. You say, what do we have to do? And no, don't make this a political thing, because it's not. But you know what you enjoy? You know why you enjoy your home? You've got doors and you've got locks on them. Amen. To keep, not because you hate the outsiders, but because you want to protect those that are home. And let me just say this, guys. There are things outside there that want to come inside here that have nothing to do with the work of God that will destroy and devour all that God has done. In ten, let me just say this, guys. It takes 10 years to look at what's happening. To see the, the work of God, the fruit, people getting saved, people getting discipled, people getting baptized, families being restored. It took 10 years to get us here. And let me tell you guys, the devil can snuff it out. Yeah. And I'm not saying that to, oh, you know, the pastor's trying to scare us. I've watched churches have been around for 50 years. And it takes one incident, just opening that door. Let me tell you something, the doors are open, but there's some things out there we don't want coming in here. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? There's an element, let me just tell you, you there's a, a time for us to consider safety. Listen, I looked it up. $60 billion in 2017 was in work-related injuries alone. Not to mention what the safety industry costs the economy. You know why companies are willing to spend billions of dollars on safety training? So that they can avoid issues that will cost them dearly. Take that into the spiritual realm. Do you know why we ought to consider the idea of keeping things safe and secure spiritually here? Do you know why? Because of the fact that there are things that the devil wants to do to infiltrate the work of God. Let me just point out, guys, it just took two guys, Sanballat, look at verse 7, Sanballat and Tobiah. It was two guys ago, man, this isn't good. These guys are progressing in the work of God. Look, look, we thought we had, we, we had ridiculed them and shamed them into keeping. And let me just tell you guys, isn't that the way the world works? If they can shame you into not speaking up for Jesus Christ, they will. If they can shame you into feeling that you are wrong for saying, no, that, that is wrong because the Bible says this, they will do that. If they can silence you and put you off in the corner, and that's where a lot of Christians, right? Let me just say it like this. A lot of Christians need to get out of the closet, jump out and go, here I am. <laughs> and not because I'm anything, but because Christ is, and I've got a great message the world needs to hear. Can I remind you on Paul's first missionary trip? Man, the very, just starting off, you know what they encounter? Trouble. Man, you know, I, I think about them getting down there, and Paul and Barnabas getting separated by the Holy Ghost, and and then the church elders lay their hands on them. And I, I just envision, you know, Paul getting down and, and Barnabas getting down next to him and then putting their arms around each other. And they, they didn't know Acts 15 was going to happen. You know, they're, they're just, they're bonded, you know. And, and there they are. And the, the church elders laying hands on them. They're praying over them, those, those leaders in the church and the pastors there. And as they get up, man, they're thinking about what is God going to do? And if you know the story in Acts 13, man, the first thing that happens the word but shows up, but Elimus the sorcerer, remember that? Guys, can you imagine being sent out by a church and all of a sudden, the first thing you encounter is a, is a warlock, a, a male witch, a sorcerer, someone that believes in enchantments and, and putting curses on people and, and trying to get, to get to the Holy Spirit by buying it and all, all the rest of that stuff. You say, what is that? That's opposition. I was talking to the preacher that's uh, hosting summer camp and he said this, I expect this year to be have more spiritual opposition than we've ever had just because it just seems to be in the air. But he also said this, where there's more opposition, there's more opportunity. Amen. Right, amen. See, the, the thing is the devil knows that. I, I would say this, can we, can we agree the last days are upon us? Can we agree with that? I'm not saying Christ has come back tomorrow. I don't know that. I wouldn't mind if he did. That's a little weak there, folks. Come on now. We're not talking about the Packers or, you know, the, or the Packers or the Packers or any other stupid team like that. But we're, we're talking about Jesus Christ coming back. Amen? Listen, listen, if he came tonight, what a blessing that would be. I don't know. But here's what I do know. Paul tells us, listen, you need to separate Matthew 24 
Because we're rightly dividing the word of God. Okay, that's what we do. And, and you need to separate Matthew 24, all these external signs to the world, earthquakes, pestilences, and, and, and wars, and rumors of wars, and all that kind of stuff. Separate that because that belongs with the tribulation and the end of the world because that's the context of that conversation. And last I checked, you're not Jacob. You are not here for Jacob's trouble. Amen. Amen. And so here we are over here with the Apostle Paul. When he talks about the last days, he's talking about the last days of the church. And he says, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. You know, God help any of you men that take selfies in the bathroom. And girls, if he doesn't, you know it. Shame on you for dating him. <laughs> and grown, I'm going to say it one more time. I might get in trouble for it. Grown men don't Snapchat. <laughs> All right? Amen. All right? I'm probably going to offend somebody. I'm actually just kidding. If you want to Snapchat, snap away. But tell them about Jesus if you're going to do that. All right? But, but here, here's the point, guys. The last days are here. Do you know who else recognizes that? The devil. You know what, if you're not sensitive to time, I know someone that is, the devil. You know what some Christians do? They go from one distraction to the next for the rest of their life. You ever notice, and I don't want to pick on phones tonight, that's not the meat of the message, but have you ever noticed sometimes you get on your phone to look at one thing, and then the hour goes by, and you're like, what did I just do? Yeah. Right? I bounce from the email to the text to the WhatsApp to the Marco Polo to the snap mm. to the twitter to the fate whatever and before you know it man like an hour has gone by one of the worst things you could do in the morning is pick your phone up before you pick up your bible Amen. i had a lot of christians go man i just i don't know man i don't have time in the morning well you know we're friends and i see you post stuff like six in the morning what are you doing that's why everyone's like disconnect 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 dis <laughs> yeah i understand i understand but you know what the Bible says in Revelation 12? I understand it's about the tribulation, but it's a spiritual principle that applies to the last days. Go, go with me to Revelation chapter 12 real quickly. Revelation chapter 12. We'll come back to Nehemiah in a little bit. By the way, next Wednesday night is question and answers night. So bring your questions and we'll give some Bible for you. Revelation chapter 12. Look, if you would, at uh, verse number 12. Re Therefore rejoice Ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. I'm not going to lie. When those SpaceX guys took off into space, I was like, take me with you. <laughs> this place is losing its mind. I want to go up there, you know. <laughs> now look what it says. For the devil is come down on you. We haven't experienced that yet. You know when things get really bad? When he's no longer roaming up there and he's like, I'm, I'm down here now. Aren't you glad you're not here for that? But I want you to understand what it says here. It's important. He comes down having great wrath. Why? Because he knoweth that he hath. Did you know when Jesus knew he had a short time, he didn't change anything about his patterns of behavior? He just was who he was all the way to the end. Pastor Adrian, what would you do differently if you knew that Jesus Christ was coming down? I'd preach. Occupy till I come. You mean you wouldn't go out and knock doors? And I wouldn't do that any other night. I'm supposed to feed the sheep. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'd rather be found here doing what I've been called to do than anywhere else in the world. Shouldn't, shouldn't, isn't that how we should go? Yeah. Well, well, let me just say this. Jesus never changes course. He's consistent. But as soon as the devil knows, okay, now my time is short, it's almost like, it's almost like a kid that's been given a task. And they know when mom and dad come back, they've got to have the room picked up. Any parents know anything of what I'm talking about? And you come in, and it's, you know, you were gone for four hours. But now it's the last five minutes. You're pulling into the driveway. We actually honk just to make sure they know we're coming down the gravel driveway. Uh, 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 you know, and scramble here, and move this, and sweep that, and wipe that up, and what are you doing? No, that does not go on your head. That, no, it doesn't belong there. Move it. Right? And what, what are we doing? We're panicking. You know what the devil does at the end times? He's panicking knowing he has but a short time. You know, what's, you know what's scary about that? A lot of Christians don't realize that. And you know what a lot of them do? They just abandon the work of God. 
Well, why is it so hard? It was intended to be hard. Listen, if it was easy, I heard someone say this years ago in business, but it's true spiritually. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Preacher, I just want to serve God and it not cost me anything and not be hard and not have any adversaries, no enemies. You are not in a church where it's going to lie to you and tell you that's how it works because it doesn't. You are going to have adversaries. You might as well make them the right ones. You know what the devil's busy doing? Devouring, giving depression, sowing seeds of division, deception, delusion, bringing you under anxiety and stress and pressure. You know what happens when Jesus gets close to the cross? He doesn't change. But the disciples forsook, and the disciples fled. And the disciples fought with each other over who's going to be the greatest. And the disciples denied the Lord and they betrayed him. And the crowd turned on him and the political leaders tried him. You see what happens? Toward the end of the, of, the, of the church, I'm telling you, the heat is getting turned up. And a lot of Christians are deciding right now, you know what? A lot of, I, I really believe this. I've heard this from a number of people, not in this church, outside of this church. I had people at work come to me and go, hey, uh, I've got someone I know, and, and they said, you know what, they're sort of tired of those big churches, and, and uh, I, I know your church isn't real big, and, I, and I'm almost like, well, yeah, we'll take all the sinners we can get, and we'll make it bigger, but we'll stay the same way. We, we, we have no desire whatsoever to become a mega church. I told you from day one, I don't want this to be the biggest church. I want it to be the best fed church in Aurora. Amen. That's my goal. But here's what I'm getting at. A lot of people are realizing, man, the show and the lights and the band and the, uh, uh, just this is wonderful, and all that feel-good stuff. It's like cotton candy. It tastes good. But it's like Chinese food. It tastes amazing. And 30 minutes later, you're hungry. That's what it's like. You don't get filled spiritually. Notice I said Chinese, not Thai, Miss Juanita. You bring all the Thai you want. Yeah, amen. Can I point something out? Go, go back to Nehemiah chapter 4. We have a work to do, guys. We have a work to do. You know, I, 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 I am encouraged when I meet missionaries and their families and see what God's doing in their lives and but I, I don't think I, I am speaking out of turn when I say this with these men here. Do you know what makes them different versus you? Ready for it? Nothing. You know what people, uh, well, I'm not going to the mission field. How about you raise some kids for God? Amen. How about you teach your kids, hey, we're in church. Shut up, sit still, learn something. Yeah, amen. I know that was a boo, lead balloon. Because no one trains their kids. I get it. I understand. But here's my point. My point is this, guys. We live in a time where people look at a, a certain ministry and go, I'm never going to do something that great. Yeah, but it's not about that. It's about you doing what God has asked you to do. Notice in Nehemiah, in verse 15, the Bible says at the end of that verse, everyone went unto his work. You say, what is that? It's a personal work. You got to take ownership of it. I, whether it's, man, I'm homeschooling my kids, or I'm, I'm teaching a Sunday school class, or I get a chance to help in the nursery, or I get to clean the church, or I, I get to, you know, uh, uh, make sure that Pastor Adrian knows what time it is, you know, and I, I get to greet people at the front door. <laughs> Whoever has the time responsibility, God help you, you know. Uh, I've had people go, preacher, are we going to start church? Uh, well, eventually we're going to start, and eventually we'll end, amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> but I want you to notice it's personal. It, it ought to be, it's not like, I've had people say, oh man, I really love your church. After they've been here for two years, I'm like, is it yours? Yeah, yeah. Right. It ought to be yours. Yeah. Man, I really like how you do, th no, no, this is, this is you. <laughs> Everyone into his own work, and I, I want you to notice in verse 17, the wording is interesting. They which build it on the wall and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, everyone with his own hands, wrought in the work. Can I say this? As far as God's concerned, there's only one work that matters. And it's the work of the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everybody has a different part in that. And, and let me, but let me just say this. That is, guys, I, I saw this picture of the Titanic. And, and, and Brother John Haffey gave me these old newspapers and and uh, uh, one of my coworkers, Justin, he goes, man, I really like that. Can I have that? And I put it, I want to put it on my, on my walls. I took a picture of it. 
and I can't remember the amount, but you know what? They did not record how many rich, how many poor, how many black, how many white, how many Hispanic. You know what it was? So many saved, so many lost. It's kind of all that matters in the end, isn't it? Here's what I'm saying. If this place, not, not the building, but this place, do you understand what I'm saying? So, some, of you, some, of you, some people have got saved here. Some people have been discipled here. Some of you have been baptized in the tank that was way too small for you. Man, Brother Felix, I, I, I was like, Lord, give me, give me extra strength like Samson, Lord. And, you know, I had my Wheaties that morning, you know. And, but, I, I, I mean, th- there's some memories here. You, don't you guys want to see more of that? That doesn't happen on accident. There, there's some responsibility for everyone here. Let, let me say this. I'll, I'll say it this way. My job as a, as a pastor, the, the word pastor, and I'm not trying to give you original languages or anything like that. How about I give you Spanish, all right? How about that? The original Spanish. All right, German shepherd, pastor alemán. All right, you see what is that? Pastor, shepherd. What, what am I getting at? Look, my job is to look out for the sheep. That is, that is the job that God has given me. But can I say this? Every church needs some sheep docs. You know what that means? It's not just me. It's you going, man, we want to keep this thing where God wants it to be. We want to make sure this place is safe. We want to make sure that when things are not quite right, we recalibrate as a church body ourselves. You know what we don't need? We don't need someone that is constantly having to go put out fires. You know why? Because we, as a church body, are going, hey, hey any of that talk? Uh, we're not taking that here. Gossip? No. No, thank you. No, no gossip. No sowing of discord. And let me just say this. We don't have that. I'm thankful. And if we do, please don't tell me after church. Because right now, it feels like we don't. I'm good with that feeling. All right? But, but, you know, come at you. Oh, brother, pastor, I'm so sorry. I've been talking about you behind your back for five years. Tell the Lord, don't tell me. All right? It's better that way. But here's what I'm getting at. You know what you can do? You can say, hey, I'm going to do my part to keep my church safe. You know, I've, I've only been saved for a couple months. You got a part in it. I've only been saved for a year. I just got baptized last year. Man, I didn't know King James Bible from any other Bible. I didn't know music. One music's good, music, but I didn't know anything. I, I don't know anything. I'm, hey, but you have a part in this. What you learn in the story is that there were nobles and there were rulers. And I want you to look at verse 19. And then there were the rest of the people. Not everybody was a noble. Not everybody was a leader. But everybody was involved. Are you hearing me? Well, I'm not, I'm not a pastor. I'm not called to preach. I, one time someone told me, I was talking to them about being a witness for the Lord, and I, I think what it was is we, we, we got done, I was witnessing somebody, and afterwards they go, man, that was really cool. I wish I had to get to evangelism. And I was like, that's not in the Bible. I don't have a gift. I have a commandment from God. And I have an opportunity to do something with that, just like we all do. I want to give you four areas of safety. And as is my custom traditionally, I give you a very lengthy introduction and very quick passing points. You can agree, you can say amen right there. Even, amen. even if it's a lie, I don't know, whatever. There's safety in the discipline of prayer. Can I show you this in verse number nine? You say, what do you do when they're coming against you and they're conspiring and... They say stuff about you, about your family, and I don't know, maybe you've been one of those people that was like, every, fr- every Sunday we used to get together with our family, now we come to church, now our cousins all think we're in a cult because we, we say, no, we'll see you later, we're coming, and it, I, you don't have to raise your hand, but I, I know people have been through that. When people are coming against you, and even sometimes family, that's when it hurts the most, or influences in your life, whatever it might be, and you're like, man, I don't really know what to do. You ever felt like, man, I'm trying to please God, I feel like I just can't please anybody? Sometimes that's not bad. Just focus on pleasing God. But I want you to notice when all the conspirers came against them, you know what they did? They knew their Second Amendment rights, and right away they got their AR-15, 
22 cal, got my ammo, got my concealed carry permit. And I'll tell you right now, if they come for my family, but they, they didn't, you know what they did? They prayed. You know the greatest defense is for this church? You know the greatest defense is for your marriage? You know the greatest defense is for your kids? You know the greatest defense is for your walk with Christ? Something that on average most preachers spend three minutes a day doing. Oh, and by the way, that poll was taken in the 90s. I don't even want to know what it is now. Preachers. The old saying is, the pew never rises higher than the pulpit. So when the preachers are spending three minutes in prayer, can I point out to you in verse 9, the Bible says, nevertheless, we made prayer, our prayer, unto our God. Can I remind you that Jesus says, take ye heed, watch and pray? Can I remind you that he says, watch and pray? And can I remind you that, that, that Paul says, ye are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night, not of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Notice here that in, the, in verse 9, they made a prayer to God and they set a watch. You ever, ever set your watch to pray? I'm going to give God 10 minutes. And after three minutes, you're like, I've been praying for 30 minutes at least. It's amazing how slow time progresses when you're praying to God and how quickly it goes by when you're scrolling. Something is, isn't it something? You know what the greatest offense for our church is? You want to keep this place safe? Now listen, in the last couple weeks, because we're trying to keep a good testimony, we're letting everybody know, hey, you know, tr let's try not to hug, and, you know, and, and hey, if you want to hug, go hug, you know, in a corner somewhere where it's very dark and no one can see, you know, or, you know, do a little quick slip, hey, bro, you know, something like that, or, you know, there's the hand sanitizer here and there, and only two in the bathroom at one time, you know, and the bathroom's downstairs, and all these different things, and let's space out families, and blah, blah, you say, why, because that's what everyone out there thinks we got to do to keep safe, but I'm going to tell you right now, more importantly than safety in that regard, I'm not saying that's bad, but more importantly than that is safety spiritually, and let me tell you right now, you know what you could have? You could have ADT and all the home defense stuff and, and all the weapons and all that kind of stuff. The greatest defense for your home is prayer. The Bible says, let us watch and be sober. You guys know what a sobriety test is? Everyone's like, no. Mm -mm, preacher, you're not going to trick me that. Oh, you got to get up earlier than that. You know, sobriety, can you walk in a straight line? What is your name? Abraham Lincoln. Okay, get him in the car, you know. I, I mean, you know, that there's, there's a certain element of things that are done to make sure you are sober and capable of moving forward in a vehicle. Let me just say this. Spiritually speaking, there are some things that we need in our lives to be sober. Not everything is a party. You know what the author of Ecclesiastes comes to realize? With life under the sun, without God, man, you know what's better? To go to the house of mourning. Why? Because that's deeper than just the house of mirth, where everything's just a big joke, and there's no need to be sober at all. And I'm not advocating you walk around like a Quaker like this. God knows we have enough Bible readers that look like that. I'm not talking about that. You gotta have some joy in your life. I believe the King James Bible. Can you smile about it? You know, maybe show everybody there's a reason you ought to be excited about the words of God in your hand. I'm not talking about that. But what I am saying is this. There's a reason to be sober and go, huh, why is everything going on like it is in the world right now? Hmm. I, I wonder if, if I'm feeling this pressure, my church family's feeling this pressure. I know what I'm about to say may sound self-serving. I, I don't mean it to. But if I'm feeling this pressure, what? Is my preacher feeling any pressure? Can I tell you right now? I will selfishly tell you I need your prayers. Do you realize there's been preachers that have preached this book for 20, 30, 40 years, and they end up at the end of all of it, when they should be riding off in the sunset with the Lord, they end up making royal mistakes that ruin the testimonies of their church, 
and ruin lives forever. I'm not saying that people weren't praying for him, but I'll tell you this, it's a great defense. You know what they said? Hey, the enemy may come. If you knew somebody was coming for your family, you guys in here, if there's any sense of testosterone in you, and I think on Sunday I might be preaching on toxic masculinity. <laughs> I'm not I think that is the message for Sunday because we need some men. We need that desperately. If there's any men in here, when I even talk about someone coming against your family, automatically there's a sort of a stiffening, sort of a, when, you're fa- when you think you're in danger, you can ask my wife, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if this is a good thing or not, when I'm afraid, my natural response is anger. I think the Lord, the only good that may ever come out of that is, it may save my life, I don't know. But, but here's what I'm getting at. If you knew someone's coming for your family, you know you do, you'd prepare. If you knew someone was coming, hey, I don't want to get on the political stuff, but if you knew someone was coming and they were breaking out the windows of businesses and your business is next in line, you'd board that thing up, you'd do everything you can to protect what's inside. What would you do spiritually to protect what's inside here? Well, preacher, I just, I mean, I, I struggle getting up in the morning. It's called being human. I don't have time. You have time to be online? I don't seem to think it's a hobby horse. I promise you it's not. You have time to be online? Do you have time to communicate with friends? Then you have time to talk to God. C.S. Lewis said, the moment you wake up each morning, all your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists in shoving it all back and listening to that other voice taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. You say, what is that prayer? Ian Bounds wrote some great books on prayer. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. Luke 18, go with me there if you would. One time, five college students went to the great church in London where Charles Spurgeon preached. They wanted to get a tour of the church. They were excited to be in the place where Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached. As they walked in, there was a man that greeted them and asked them what they were there for and where they were from. And Let me just say this. It's kind of nice to have greeters in your church, isn't it? It's, it's kind of nice to like walk in and someone says hi to you. And, you know, when you, listen, when you go to a new church, I remember this from deputation. You walk in, you're like, okay, where's the bath? First question I have, where's the bathroom? Okay, you know, and, and is anyone actually here? Sometimes you walk in, you look around, you're like, okay, there's it's five minutes till. Come on. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? And it's kind of nice when there's people there and there's someone to greet you. And this guy, these, these five college kids walk in and this man greets him and says, how could I help you? And they start inter- interacting with each other. And, and they said, man, we just want to see the, the place where Spurgeon, we want to go to his pulpit. And he walks and shows him the pulpit. And he goes, let me, let me tell you, you might like this, but I got a better place than that. He said, can I take you to the furnace room? Now, keep in mind, it's London. It's the 1800s, and it's the summer. Who wants to go to the furnace room? The last few days, my office at work has had no AC. You know, we're just suffering for Jesus in there, you know. And so everyone's, you know, hey, can you get us fans? And you get them fans, you know. And last night I got one of those little squirty things, you know. I'm walking around squirting myself, you know, and trying to stay cool and all that kind of stuff. Just <laughs> as you might imagine your pastor would, you know. And uh, here it is summertime, and this guy's like, you want to see the furnace room? And, you know, trying to be nice. And anyone ever offered, like, hey, you want to you see my baby? And you're like, I don't really care about your baby. <laughs> you know, here's my, you know, pull out, back in the day it was pull out wallet. Okay, wallets are leather folding things that <laughs> have card slots. And then you have pictures. They used to have pictures in them. Remember that? All right? And you would go and you'd meet people, oh, this is my daughter. And look at, oh, this is so cute, you know, and that kind of thing. And, 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 and now we have it on the phones, right? Here, look at this, look at this. And sometimes you're like, you want to see this? And you're like, 
Yeah. Yeah. So not to be mean, they're like, sure, let's go look at the furnace room. When they get down there, you know what they find in the furnace room? Hundreds of men on their knees praying before church. As the story goes, at the end of that, he introduces himself and he says, I'm, I'm Charles Spurgeon. And I just wanted you to know the reason that this is powerful is because I got some heat down there. You got to pray with thanksgiving. You got to pray instantly. Sometimes you don't have a lot of time to pray. So Nehemiah prays to the God of heaven like that. You got to pray without ceasing. You got to pray with fervency. You know, kind of like the way you get excited about a tax refund or the extra $600 a week, right? That's going to run out soon. You're like, God, please let the government be stupid and forget. (laughs) There's... $600 $600 more dollars every week, Lord, for the next 20 years of my life. God, if you could do that, I'll go to church every time the doors are open. I'll tithe off of it, God. I'll do it, right? The, the same way you get excited about that stuff, you got to get down your knees and go, God, we have an anniversary celebration coming up. And God, our kids are going to summer camp. And God, our Sunday school is starting back up. And Lord, this fall we've got institute. You don't think the devil notices that stuff, by the way? How much time are you praying for that? Maybe you are. Praise the Lord if you are. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just trying to say there are reasons to pray. Robert Murray McShane said this, what a man is on his knees before God, that he is nothing more. You know what the sinless son of God did? He prayed for his disciples. He prayed for Lazarus. He prayed for the food to multiply. He prayed for the healing of others. He prayed for strength. And let me just say this, he prayed for us. Look, if you would, at Luke 18. Jesus speaking, he spake a parable then to this end that men ought always to pray, verse 1, and not to faint, saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. We got some of those now in our own country. There was a widow in that city, and she came unto him saying, avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me. (laughs) You know what that is? Mom, 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 (laughs) mom, 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 mom. And, and, you know, let me just say this. I've been in stores, maybe you guys have too, where the kid is like doing that. And I want to go, Mom, your kid is talking to you. You can tune him out, but we can't. (laughs) But you know what? After a while, mom, mommy, mommy, mom, mom, dad, dad, dad. After a while, I go, what? You know what some of you need to realize? The way you are with things of this world, if you would be that way for God, and God, I need you to help me with this, and God, I can't make it. God, you know how weak I am. God, and you just kept that. You know what the Lord would do? He's much better than an unjust judge. But if he saw sometimes that he just, listen, I think it's the same reason why he didn't answer that widow woman as we talked about on Sunday right away. Just to see how important it was to her. How important is this church to your family? You ever think, what would we do if it's just gone? Oh, I got an extra hour of sleep on Sunday. Yeah, but what would it cost you? Go back to Nehemiah chapter 4. There's safety in the discipline of prayer. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever done this before, but you don't need to show no raise of hands or anything like that, but anybody here ever been a little out of shape? You don't have to, no, don't raise your hand. It's okay. And you go, you know what? I watched Rocky last week, and I I know I can do this, you know. (laughs) You know, and you're going to whip up some eggs and drink them, you know. And, and then you're like, okay, here we go. And you lie down. And you're like, one. Oh, yeah, that was good. <laughs> you know why? You're just, you're not disciplined yet. First time you get down to pray about anything. Some of you teenagers have a lot of time on your hands. I know some of you are starting to work. I get it. But if you've got time for PlayStation, then you've got time <laughs> For the Lord. 
Why should you wait until you're 18, 19, 20 years old when they're trying to fill your mind with garbage about evolution, you know, uh, uh, situational ethics, social justice, and all the rest of that garbage? Why would you wait until then to go, huh, I wonder if God is right, and have all this garbage pumped in your head and go, oh man, what do I do? You better start preparing now. You know, you know what, we all, everyone convinces themselves, I don't have time, I can't do it. Let me just say this much, the first time you say, I'm going to develop a habit of prayer, you're going to notice the phone buzzes, this happens, that happens, you get in an argument with your spouse, I know nobody here would ever do that, and, and you know, the kid, you had an argument with your kid, whatever it may be, and then you get down to pray, and then you're angry, you're upset, you're frustrated, and you start to pray, and you look up, and you think it's been an hour, and it's been 30 seconds. And you're like, God, I just, I can't do this. Can I tell you what you need to do? Get down again. And get down again. And get down again. Here's what I know about bullies. And I know this, maybe all the moms are like, don't listen, son. Sometimes the only way to deal with a bully is head on. Not advocating, preachers advocating violence. No, no, just calm down. At the same time, like, use some common sense. If you're about to get beat up, you need to fight back. Do you understand? And so what I'm getting at is this from a spiritual standpoint, if I can apply it this way, the devil's a bully. And when he knows all it takes is this little thing and this little thing and this little thing, you're like, okay, I can't do it. I've watched grown men who are bodybuilder type, just strong men, you know, manly men. And when it comes to their Bible reading, <laughs> and when it comes to their prayer time, <laughs> And you know what that is? It's just not right. You know what it is? It's a discipline. You can form it. There's safety in the discipline of prayer. Can I say this? There's safety in having discernment. Look, if you would, at Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 11. And our adversary said, they shall not know, neither see, till we watch it come in the midst among them. Do you know what the devil wants to do? He wants to counterfeit the work of God and replace the gospel of Jesus Christ with a different message and replace God's music with different music and replace God's... Ha- you know what it takes to, to watch out for that? Discernment. Discernment. Can you not see, anyone that's been saved for 20, let's say just say 20, anyone here been saved 20 years? Have you, Miss, Miss Virginia, can I pick on you for a moment? Have you not seen a shift since the 90s when we were kids and you were to now? And let me just tell you, it ain't, that train has left the, has left the station, it ain't going to slow down. You better hold on and say, you know what, I'm going to hold fast to the things, the, the form of sound words, and I want to have some discernment in my life so I don't get swept up in everything going on around me. You know what it was? Hey, listen, we're going to come in the midst among them. You know that's the same terminology that's used for Jesus Christ's presence? Why? The devil wants to counterfeit what God is doing right in our lives. So you know what you replace soul winning with? Little activities. That, I'm not against activities. I love them. That's great. But man, when you get away from the gospel of Jesus Christ, you replace it with a social gospel. And let me tell you, a lot of churches are doing that. Let me tell you, God's not a Republican, God's not a Democrat, he's not white, he's not black, he doesn't care about all this crazy stuff that the world's talking about, he cares more about the souls of men and getting to the root issue. The root issue is sin. And if we don't, if we let go of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we lose everything. Let me just say it like this, it takes discernment to see what's going on. There's safety in that. Aren't you, listen, let me just say something. When that raccoon came and started messing with our chickens, my response was not, oh, that stinks. Well, let's just leave everything like it's been. <laughs> he won't come back again. You know what we did? We forgot one time. He came back. One time. You know what we did for a week? Shut everything up, put the trap out, come out in the morning. I'm like, God. You can rain down manna from heaven. Can you put the raccoon in the box? (laughs) And that one time after a week that I didn't put the trap out and I left that back hatch door open. You know what that is? That's the devil. You leave the wrong door open and he's in. 
know what it takes? It takes some discernment to go, okay, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. You, you ever watch, I feel like sometimes as a pastor, I watch Christians do this. Oh. I got this time. No. Okay. I'm like, walk around the thing. <laughs> that way, you know? There's a, there's a better way to do this. You say, what is it called? Discernment. It's not the gospel of our rights. It's not about, man, changing the doctrine, all that kind of, We need to have discernment about what's going on, not just in the world, but in the churches around us. Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's to obey, but strong meat belongeth unto them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Can I say this? Their discernment led them to do three things. It led them to pray. It led them to continue to work. And it led them to prepare for a fight. Can I point out to you that it wasn't a binary choice? Either we work or we hold the sword. You know what they did? Let's keep working. And just for good measure, let's stay protected. Let's keep doing what God's called us to do. Our mission hasn't changed. But just for good measure, I've got the sword in my hand. And when the devil comes, I just say, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. Yeah, but you guys are never going to accomplish. I mean, I mean, if, if a fox walked on, on the top of that wall, it would crumble. It is written, it is written. Yeah, but you guys are just feeble Jews, but God commanded us to do it. It is written, it is written. Yeah, but you guys are independent Baptists. I mean, what even is that? I mean, what, what exactly is it? It's like grape nuts. It's not grapes, it's not nuts. What are independent, you know, what, what is a King James Bible? You guys are old-fashioned. It is written, it is written, it is written. Where am I getting at? Listen, guys, it's it takes discernment, and you can't do that without the right tool and the right weapon in your hand. So many Christians have let go of the sword. They've replaced it with a different message, replaced it with different methods. Let me just tell you right now, guys, our church over the years, by the grace of God, we're, we've grown and we are growing and thankful for that. But I, I can tell you right now, there have been times where you know, churches, they go through cycles and seasons and sometimes they're up and there's more people and more things going on and God adding to the church and sometimes it's down. Let me just tell you what you're tempted to do. Maybe I should, you know, I've had people say, preacher, maybe, you know, you shouldn't preach so long. Now, the one time, the last time someone told me that, I said, okay, and I, maybe it got in the flesh. I don't know. You guys tell me. <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what. When you quit saying up playing video games until two and three in the morning, I'll preach less. I may have gotten in the flesh. I'm not sure. But there's safety in discernment. There's safety in doctrinal truth. Look at verse 16 and verse 17. You know what they did? They held on to that sword. Verse 17, they which build on the wall and they that bear burdens with those that laid it. Can I tell you this? There are some that are bearing burdens here. And I am thankful for those that bear burdens and do it with a smile on their face. I, I've watched Sunday school teachers with boots. I don't mean like, you know, boot, normal boot, but like a cast type of boot, hobble down the stairs to teach our kids. I, I've, watched, I've watched people come in knowing that they got here, man, just in the nick of time, and they are tired, and the kids were arguing in the car, and you know, you can tell when the kids got the shoes on the wrong foot, that wasn't a good morning, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, and they go back and they serve in the nursery with a smile on their face. And, and I, I can tell you this, look, just because Brother Sean and Brother Craig are always smiling doesn't mean they don't have problems. But they're smiling. Now, some of you think that's a sin. It's okay to smile. I mean, you know, I mean, the world is doing it, and they're doing it out of being fake, and they've got nothing to smile about. They've got no real joy. You've got it. There's some bearer burdens. I want you to notice everyone with, his, everyone with one of his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. Guys, doctrine and sound doctrine is a worthy defense against the devil. Go with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Just so you guys know, we'll definitely be done 
by about 8.30 Hawaii time. (laughs) Philippians chapter 3. Look, if you would, at verse 1. I like like Paul, and I kind of get the feeling that maybe he was an independent, Bible-living Baptist preacher himself, because he says here in chapter 3 and verse 1, finally... And after 21 verses, he starts over in another chapter. (laughs) And eight verses into that chapter, he says, finally, brethren. And for 15 more verses, he doesn't shut up. I can relate to that. But I want you to look at chapter 3 and verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous. (laughs) I've had people say, well, that's old-fashioned. Isn't that kind of old? Isn't that kind of... <sighs> There's this thing called oxygen. It's been around a long time, but it works really well. There's this thing called sunshine. Been around for 6,000 years. Works really well. Here's what I'm getting at. Some things need to be said over and over and over and over. And let me just say this. Over the course of the next few years, you'll notice I'll talk about rightly dividing the Word of God, and I'll teach through that, and I may go over it more than once. You say, why? Because when people get here, they're all messed up in all kinds of ways on their doctrine. It's not a slam on anybody. I'm glad anyone comes. I'm just saying, sometimes people don't know. They've never been taught. That's what the church is for. And they come in thinking, I could lose my salvation because I think I may have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. Me and Brother Trace were talking about that. And, 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 and they don't know, okay, is, what is this all about? And, and if they didn't understand that Jesus Christ is talking about something you can only commit during his earthly ministry or during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, you might think you'd committed it. You say, what's that called? Right dividing the word of God. You know what sound doctrine will do? It will help you. See, why do we have a need for sound doctrine? Because there's coming a time when people will not endure it. Can I point out in Philippians 3, he talks about people that he calls dogs, evil workers. Preacher, I just don't think you should talk like, well, Paul did. Kind of think he's a good guy. I don't know. I mean, he writes half the New Testament. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. You know what he's trying to say? I want you to be safe. That guy that gets up and says, Ashtalashantai, untie the bow tie, send me your money and you'll be safe. He's not looking out for you. He wants something. From, you know what my job is? To make sure as best as I can that you're safe. Now, I cannot impose my will even on my own children. I can, while they're in my house, like the rules are the rules and all that kind of stuff. But there comes a day where they have to go, okay, I'm going to do this not because dad is watching me, but because what dad taught me is right and it's true. And the same applies spiritually in this place. I, I, I pray you understand, it's not just what well, Pastor Adrian said, and that's what we know at our church. No, no, it's what the Bible says, and it's good for you all the way around. There's coming a time when people won't endure it. I think we're there. I think we're there. <laughs> you see, what's the method for holding on to sound doctrine? Holding fast the faithful what? Word. Preacher, it seems like every message, somehow the Bible makes its way in the message. It's kind of how it works, I don't know, because it's kind of like the main text where it all comes from. So, see, what's the purpose of sound doctrine? Now, here's something you may not have considered. Look at Mark chapter number one. Mark chapter number one. Especially Wednesday night Bible study, so I'm going to try to give you some study in here in the mix of all the preaching. As we hurry to wrap this up, Mark chapter number one. Now, when I tell you, okay, I'm going to teach on what the Bible says about the millennium, or I'm going to teach on what the Bible says about the tribulation, I'm going to teach on what the Bible says about eternal security, or I'm going to teach on what the Bible says about the Bible itself, or I'm going to teach about the Trinity, or about God uh, uh, the Son, or God the Spirit. I'm going to teach about these are, these are things you go, okay, that's doctrine. So, like, that's stuff about God. And that's, like, over here, and then here's me paying my bills, and my kids, you know, and the dentist appointments, 
and I take the insurance and they don't register and it's like, oh, you don't have insurance. Yes, I do. I pay a lot of money for this. You're not showing up in the system. Look again, right? <laughs> so there's, there's this doctrine stuff and then there's my practical life and that's how we tend to divide things. I think we might be cutting ourselves short though. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus is doing something that the Pharisees could not do because Jesus spoke with authority because he spoke the words of God. So in Mark 1, I want you to look at verse number 27. They were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves, saying, what thing is this? What new what? For with authority, watch it, he commandeth even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Was Jesus like sitting down going, okay, let me teach you about the doctrine of the deeps or the doctrine of the tribulation or the doctrine of the church and the hidden mystery or the doctrine of the one body or the doctrine of this? No, 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 no. He wasn't like sitting them down and going, okay, here's the chalkboard. Questions, give me your questions. Okay, here's the answers. Doctrine. You know what he was doing? He was healing somebody. He was doing something practical. And they said, what new doctrine? You know what I'm getting at? Doctrine affects your every day life come on guys if you thought you could lose your salvation tomorrow how great of a witness are you going to be for jesus christ you really want to try to offer something to somebody that you don't even know if you even have it you see doctrine affects your life practically when you understand the doctrine of christ in the church it can affect your marriage when you understand the doctrine of god the father adopting us as a fool what kind of fight is this? I don't look at this and go, these stupid, I look at it and go, these poor souls, man. I don't care what your ideology is. You might be a communist for all I know. I don't care. You got a soul. <laughs> Some of you think communists have souls. They do. <laughs> they do. Some people fight for a false cause. Some people fight for any cause. You ever been around those people? Where's the fight? Let's go. I mean, some Christians just want to fight. I mean, you know, let's fight about vaccines and let's fight about homeschooling versus public school. And let's fight about this. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a worthy cause. David, when he gets there, and the giant's there, and you know the story. And his brothers are like, man, why are you here? Why are you? Why did you take time away from home? You should be watching the sheep. <laughs> what are you doing? You just want to see the action, don't you? I've been around younger Christians when they first get saved and they're just excited and like, this is all new. You've been around that? It's really cool. And sometimes older Christians are like, well, you just stick around long enough. It'll be boring after a while. <laughs> You're just excited right now about going. You know, some are like, I want to go street preaching. I've never gone before. And some people will be like, well, you know, all, no, no, listen, it's better stay excited. Far better, far better. David hears his brother say this stuff. And you know what he says? Is there not a cause? Man, isn't this worth fighting for? I've seen those t-shirts say, this, you know, the flag, this will I defend. And I'm not saying you, you shouldn't. I'm not saying that, you know, I, I'm a patriot. I love all that stuff. But the point is this. Some Christians would rather go march for that than stand behind the Bible and go, I'll defend this. Amen. Let me just say this right now. I got to get this off my chest. I watched two black sisters in Christ walk into that crazy place in Seattle and walk up to a bunch of people and go, you need Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ. A bunch of men won't do that. Right. Two black sisters in Christ. I don't know where they're from, what church they're from, but man, they are shaking those people down and those people get all excited and crazy. Like, and they wouldn't. The Holy Spirit was on those two ladies. I'll tell you that right now. They're walking up to people and people are backing up. Amen. You know what? I love that. That's a good thing. You say, what is that? That's someone standing up for something that matters. You say, what are they doing? Giving people some doctrine. Let me say this in closing. Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. Last time you turn there. I have to tell you, when I watched that video, I got all fired up. I thought, man, here's some, some older women saved, 
walking into the belly of the beast of some crazy place and giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what happened? God protected them. Let me say this in closing. There's safety and divine intervention. Look, if you would, at verse 15. It came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known in us and God had brought their counsel to not. Do you realize everything, everything I've said so far, it all goes back to God. If you don't protect us and you don't keep us safe and you don't bless this church, we're toast. God, if you don't bless my family, you don't protect my marriage, God, I'm going to hit some trouble. God, I need you. God, it's all about you. It's not about me. Look, if you would, at verse 20. In what place, therefore, you hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us. Let me stop for a moment. Can I remind you? Let me ask you a simple question. It's not a trick question. Who has the swords in their hands? It's the people, right? And yet it says, our God will fight for us. It's not, a, it's not a matter of you going, I'm not going to do anything and God's going to... Sh- no, you, you're doing what God has asked you to do, but God's the one that does the fighting for you. Do, do you know what we need here? Some divine intervention. God, I don't want to quit. God, we're not done. God, we just got started. God, we want to see more people get saved. We would like to send some more missionaries out. God, we'd like to see some more kids get discipled. God, we'd like to see someday, 10 years from now, Lord, some of the kids that are in Sunday school go off to Bible school and get surrender. And God, maybe go to the mission field or do whatever you want. God, we're not done. But God, none of this matters if you don't divinely intervene. Several times you'll find this. I'll encourage you to study it out. In Ezra and Nehemiah, you'll find the phrase, the good hand of our God. Let me tell you something. You know what we need tonight? You know what you need in your home? Do you know what we need in the house of God? Do you know what you need in your marriage? Do you know what you need in your walk with God? You need God's hand. We went out in the park. We were getting out of the car the other day and started walking the parking lot, and all of a sudden, this little guy right here, I think he's faking sleeping. I'm not sure. He's so good at that, man. There are times I go in the room, I'm like, he's asleep. And Preston's like, no, 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 no. It's like, Dad, you know nothing. He's not. He's faking. We get out of the car and get in the parking lot right away. He comes and runs and grabs my hand. You say, why? It's kind of instinctive for a kid. Do you know what we need tonight? That principle of safety led them to pray, led them to work, it led them to fight, and it led them to seek God's help. David says it like this, For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. Let's all stand. Father, tonight, oh, Lord, I, these dear people, oh, They are a blessing to me. And God, they come and they fight traffic and they, Lord, scramble to get off of work in time and cross, get across town and get their kids fed and have dinner and get here to church. And they do that because they need something from you. God, I pray you would have given it to them tonight. Lord, I pray you'd help us, Lord, to put up a defense against the world, against the flesh, and against the devil. Lord, in this place and in our lives, Lord, we might have some men and some women of God, Lord, who might submit, Lord, and build some habits of discipline in their prayer life. Lord, they might be willing to defend truth and have discernment and hold on to sound doctrine and just plead that you might intervene here for another 10 years. God, we're thankful these doors are open, but God, we know the enemy wants to destroy and distract and devour. God, would you speak to the hearts of all that are here tonight? This piano player plays that the Lord has dealt with you. You've got some room at the altar here. Take advantage of it. Maybe you need to get with your family and build that habit of prayer. 
All I know is this, guys. The world is beating in harder than I've ever seen it beat in before. And our families don't have a shot. Our marriages won't have a shot. Our kids won't have a shot. This church won't have a shot if we don't have people of God who understand the times in which we live and truly seek for divine intervention. I'm thankful. I am thankful that God has allowed us to be here. But don't take it for granted. And don't think for a moment the devil doesn't want to do do what he can to hold up and delay the work of God. you got something out of it the Lord spoke to you we've got a good thing here and not because of us but because of him and I believe the Lord wants us to do our part to protect it to keep it safe to keep it right and I want you guys to know I love you guys I love my church thankful to pastor here let's all do our part to keep it what it is as we continue to grow as long as the Lord has us here. Amen.